Welcome to the ATV Project, episode 46, Food Timing for Fat Burning. In today's podcast, Matt and I discuss understanding the hierarchy of fuel used when training for fat loss. What is AMPK and how does it help burn fat? Is fasted cardio really better than non-fasted cardio? Meal timing to stop catabolism and aid muscle growth. And finally, good supplements to use to maximize fat burning and when to use them. As always, we have some listener FAQs and a whole lot more. Stay tuned. The ATP Project is about to start. Welcome to the ATP Project. Delivering the irreverent truth about health, ageing, performance and looking good. If you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, ready to perform at your best or somewhere in between, then sit back, relax and open your mind as Jeff and Matt battle the status quo and discuss everything health related that can make you better. Welcome to the ATP Project. You're with your host, Matt and Jeff. Matt, we've G'day. been talking about fat burning a bit lately. Yes. Last week we spoke about hepatothermic. Did I get it right? Yes. Yeah, excellent. Nice so work. this week we're going to be talking about maximizing fat burning through AMPK. AMK, if you want to, mm-hmm. like, that's what the cool kids call it. AMK. Okay. Um, and it's basically a version two or, or a, of, of the first one because, I mean, that's just one strategy for burning fat. And there are lots of strategies for burning fat. This title, though, will probably catch a few people's attention. So you're going to summarise and also expand upon some of the understanding that we have around fat burning according to the research that you've been looking at. Yeah. And there are some key things that you think, Matt, that we can shed light and help people with when's the best time to train, what type of training should I be doing, what about macronutrients, when should I be eating, all that sort of crap. Yeah, well. And the, and the stuff that not only the – that the average person wants to know to maximize their fat burning, but maybe some t- tips and tricks and the reason why people who are getting good results are probably getting them from, yeah. a, from a theoretical point of view. Yeah, yeah. Well, interestingly, the more um, research I do, the more I realize that we've got to go back to the basics and get a good understanding of the basics before we try to get too clever. You know, like um, <clears throat> people like Michael Galley, I chat to him all the time about what the pros do. Mm-hmm. And the pros do the old school stuff. They don't do a lot of the the new, you know, new strategies of, you know, extreme bits and pieces. They they kind of trust a process and that sort of stuff and know when to chop and change. Mm. And so when going through the research, there's a few basic stuff that is well known and well proven that we can utilise, you know, um, but understanding why these things work in some people, why they don't work in other people, knowing when to chop and change, that's mm-hmm. the challenge. Mm. Um so the you know, body's an adaptive mechanism. Well, that's the big you, thing. And, and so you've got to keep mixing up. Exactly. And that's also too, because we're an adaptive organism, because we're all so different, that's why there is so much research out there. There are so many different strategies that all work for a particular person for a particular period of time. More than one way to skin a <clears throat> Yeah, well, like you're going through it. I was, you know, part of the research process, you're trying to see what people are doing and what works, you know, and you've, mm-hmm. you've noticed a few different um, types of you know, testimonials <laughs> or something, you know. Like, for example, you see a lot of people out there are doing diet strategies without exercise, you know. Like you see a lot of these companies are <clears throat> don't want the legal or the insurance issues about trying to encourage people to exercise, so they're providing diet strategies and saying don't exercise. Yeah, you VLC know? diets, so like very, very low. Yeah, that's diets. right. I mean, and that's one way. But again, yeah. then the body adapts and, and then, then yo-yo exactly. dieting, that's where the, that term came from. Yeah, right? exactly. And then you got the other guys. So, like, typically – through Google and through word of mouth, you know, they're seeing all these testimonials about these HCG diets and these low calorie diets and everything. Yeah, what's, H- what's HCG diet? <clears throat> uh, it's the pregnancy hormone where they tell them to go 500 calories and um, inject or um, inhale the pregnancy hormone to trick the body into thinking you're starving and pregnant. So you better liberate your stored fat. Bloody hell. Problem is, is they burn muscle first, you know, of course, yeah. <clears throat> and um, does all sorts of weird stuff. Mm. Those sort of things are usually just found through Google searching or word of mouth, you know. Mm. Um, then you get the group that do the exercise without the diet, which is basically I just joined a gym, mm. you know. <laughs> so they, they've joined a gym and they're hooking in and they're telling everyone how great they are and that you exercise hard enough, you don't have to worry about food. And that works for certain people for a certain period of time. I mean, I had a girl that used to work for me and yeah. she was a um, – a uh, cardio instructor. She used to take all the classes. And seriously, her breakfast was um, Ferrero Rocher. 
Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and she was lean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Know, yeah. But, I mean, again, you know. Probably, so there's, there's that school of thought that yeah. things exercise without, you know, it doesn't matter what you eat if you exercise hard enough, yeah. you know. Mm-hmm. And there's certain people that works for, you know. Yeah. Of course, there's certain people that doesn't. Mm. Uh, and then there's the diet and the exercise strategy, which is usually when they've done those first three options and then they met a PT. They come in and said, no, seriously, <laughs> you need to combine, combine a bit of diet and exercise, well, that's you know. synergistic, that yeah. makes sense. Some people are doing the supplementation alone without the diet and exercise, which is basically I magic went online bullet. shopping. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm looking for the magic bullet. Yeah. Some salesperson said, this is all you need to do. Then there's this weird group that listen to the ATP project that combine diet, exercise and supplementation yeah. with a strategy and work with a professional to know when to chop and change between the different diet and supplemental strategy. Well, I mean, That's what it actually takes to get the consistent results. And I know? think that's optimum. And, again, yeah. again, it depends on your goals. I mean, yeah. like if you're trying to shed 10 kilos and you're not looking at competing, then mm. getting some good advice, eating well, um, you know, going for your walks and training and, and you know, utilising good supplements to make sure that your hormonal profile's there, that your body's actually able to access yeah. the fat, that's all that that person needs. We're not saying that you need to go and get a yeah. PT for that. So yeah. it all comes down to your goals and, and, and what it is that you're trying to achieve. Yeah, exactly. It's quite interesting too, a lot of the research, when I'm reading through the research, it's quite weird. If you want to create a, a drug or a treatment or a medication or something like that, that corrects obesity, a lot of the trials you're not actually allowed to do on obese people. So they have to do it on healthy, trained athletes with a certain body fat percentage and show that it will cause them to lose weight, thereby allowing it to make a claim that it is actually has anti-obesity effects. It's weird. You can't do a make an anti-obesity claim based on research on obese people. I mean, it's coming to mind. I mean, obviously, there's hormonal profiles, insulin resistance. Exactly. There's all sorts of things that would be So we've got, to, we've got to look at all these sort of things when we're creating a strategy. But anyway, um, there are some really, really cool things in regards to fat burning I don't want to go through. But the basics I want to cover first. For some people, they might find this as a bit of a refresher. And that sort of stuff, but um, but there's some cool stuff here as well too, Matt. That we've never spoken before. Yeah. So just if you think, okay, we've heard some of this before. No. Oh no 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 no. This is cool, man. Like seriously, <clears throat> you know, a lot of these things we just kind of forget, <laughs> you know, because um, we get too complicated. We get too deep into these things. So mm-hmm. yeah, basically, I want to talk about how we use different types of fuel through ex- through exercise. Okay. Um, so can I throw some? Can I throw some? I mean, you've spoken a little bit about there from why people go to the gym or what people's thought process are, diet yeah. only or exercise only or diet and exercise or then supplementation, then yeah. PT and blah, blah, blah. So when I was working at my retail supplement store, I used to see all those people come through, a lot coming through the, for the magic bullet, which, you know, again, just doesn't exist. There's no. there's no such thing. But, Matt, the biggest debates that I see that people talk about is fasted cardio, High intensity cardio versus steady state cardio, and I know that we've said before both are good. And yeah. again, because we're an adaptive, you know, uh, mechanism. But can you break down the science of that? Yeah. Can you also look into food timing? You know, again, fasted cardio first thing in the morning is that really beneficial to training at night? What about doing, um, um, uh, you know, small and those regular meals, and you know, all that sort of stuff, man. Yeah. So, I mean, again, we've touched on it, we've, we've broken it down. If you can collaborate all that together and maybe talk about some of the research that you've got there, all right. Well, let's talk about um, <clears throat> meal timing first, then, mm-hmm. <clears throat> you know, regarding fasted cardio. Okay, the definition of fasted for starters, you know, so fasted basically in the scientific community, it means that you haven't consumed a meal containing carbohydrates and that sort of stuff within about four hours prior to the exercise, okay? Does it also include proteins and fats? Surely. Yeah, it does. It does. it does. it does. It does. It does. But you're thinking for this that there is actually a bit of a... No, in the research, they're basically showing a lot of it is the carbohydrate and that sort of stuff because when we're talking about it in regards to um, being in a fasted state, we're talking about it being in a carbohydrate deficit, you know, mm-hmm. with the glycogen depletion, the lower blood sugars and that sort of stuff, mm-hmm. um, and in low insulin. Okay, so the, oh, okay. the signals that insulin hasn't been secreted. Okay, and that's that's the way they define, um, you know, whether you're in a fasted state prior to exercise. Mm. So basically what the reason why I'm telling you that is because we all say, you know, fasted cardio is basically before breakfast and that sort of stuff. Get up in the morning and do your fasted cardio. Just for some people that doesn't fit into their routine, but having a four-hour break from meals and then doing the cardio actually in the studies has 
uh, can induce the same response. Really? Is it, mm. Do you know if it's as good or was there any comparable studies for people who had actually woken up and did fast oh, well, so after 12 hours <clears throat> of not eating yeah, anything? Yeah, yeah. There's one cool study that they did. Um, there's only a small study like with 10 people in it. Uh-huh. But um, what they did in that, they made them exercise at different stages of the day and calculated their 24-hour energy expenditure. So basically calculated their basal metabolic rate for the 24 hours um, based on different times of the day of exercising. And what they found is the only time of the day exercising induced an increase in metabolic rate for the whole 24 hours was before breakfast. Really? So they found in that small group that training before breakfast caused a glycogen depleted. It caused that carbohydrate deficit first thing in the morning mm-hmm. where it depleted all of the glycogen in the muscle and the liver. Well, mm-hmm. not all of it, well, enough of it, you know, mm-hmm. um, to improve insulin sensitivity yeah. and improve the basal metabolic rate because right. the body wants to replenish that depleted glycogen. Yeah. So while it's wanting to replenish that um, depleted glycogen, you become insulin sensitive. In fact, GLUT4 transporters actually work <clears throat> independently of insulin in that situation where they're craving sugars through. Right, so break down GLUT4 and oh. also ins- in- insulin sensitivity just puts Yeah, yeah, sorry. <clears throat> Insulin's job is to take sugar out of your blood. Yep. That's all it cares about. Yep, yep. The way it does that is by binding into a receptor. That causes this vehicle called GLUT4 to translocate to the membrane. <laughs> Basically, it works like a little train. <laughs> yep. So the insulin binds into the receptor, says sugar's here, sugar's coming. Yep. GLUT4 activated to drag, to open the door basically to allow sugar in. Right. During exercise or during a glycogen depleted state or during a fasted state or yep. during a low calorie diet or yep. in a ketogenic diet, mm-hmm. the GLUT4 is constantly activated, ready to accept sugar because you're in a glycogen depleted state. So less chance of that sugar being converted to fat. Yeah, absolutely. And also less chance of that thing you're consuming causing an insulin spike. Yeah. Okay, so it's quite interesting because they find, um, for example, I'll probably jump around a little bit here, but um, the studies where they did um, post-training meals, you know, where they said – you know, what do we eat after training? Are you talking muscle training or you're like you're talking weight bearing training or, or high intensity cardio training? Don't matter. Training Don't matter. After matter. exercise. Yep. So basically, what they found is you could induce protein synthesis equally by supplying protein with or without carbs. Because, see, what happens, insulin is a very anabolic compound, okay? So yep. insulin stimulates muscle growth. More than testosterone. I think. Yeah, yeah. So insulin is very powerful anabolic. <clears throat> so what happens is after exercise, when you're in a glycogen depleted state, you don't need to have that same insulin spike. You don't secrete anywhere near as much insulin in response to carbohydrates or non-nutritive sweeteners post-exercise as you do before exercise. So what that basically means is the studies show that having protein alone does just the same protein synthesis as combining protein with carbohydrate (sighs) post-exercise So because you don't get the insulin spike. Interestingly, hmm. if you have a meal before exercise, yeah. now this is the thing, anywhere, the meal could be anywhere within four hours prior to exercise, uh-huh. it significantly inhibits fat loss during that exercise. Right. Because what happens is you're having a meal prior to exercise that can st- uh, stimulate insulin secretion. Mm-hmm. That basically switches off fat burning until you've burned through that carbohydrate. Insulin blocks carnitine, palmitol transferase. Yeah. A funny thing, so imagine this. Imagine if that thing you had before exercise was loaded up with carnitine <laughs> yeah. to be a fat burner. Yeah. To, or what do they say with carnitine? You know, to make fat your primary source of fuel yeah. or something like that. <clears throat> but if it's got something that induces insulin with it, yeah. the insulin's going to block the enzyme that carnitine is fueling yeah. to burn fat. So basically what I'm saying is anything you consume before training will put a bluntening effect on fat burning. Hmm. What's interesting is there's a certain group of people that dispute that. They say, no, I've been doing this forever. I've been smashing my proteins and my essential aminos and my branch chain amino, been smashing all that sort of stuff forever before during training. And look how shredded I am compared to these fat people. Yeah. Interestingly, in trained people with low body fat percentage, they are insulin sensitive. Mm-hmm. They don't have the same problem of switching off fat burning that someone with a larger body fat percentage and insulin resistance will have. Right. Okay. Interestingly, yeah, insulin right. resistance, man. Hey, I was mm-hmm. just talking about insulin resistance causing an exaggerated insulin spike that stops fat burning. But I did just say that insulin is also anabolic. 
So not many people really understand the link there also with insulin resistance in regards to protein synthesis. Just as easily as you can become insulin resistant leading to obesity, you also can be insulin resistant for its anabolic effects and muscle. So insulin resistance isn't just fat, you know. So what happened, what I'm saying is if you've got insulin resistance, Mm -hmm. you've got a certain amount of body fat, Mm -hmm. this insulin resistance gets worse and worse, your muscles are also insulin resistant and insulin doesn't work like an anabolic agent in fat people like it does in lean trained people. So what that causes is is the gap, you know, gets worse and worse and worse. So with insulin resistance, you're preserving fat all the time because you're blocking fat burning, but you're also not getting that muscle building benefit in most, in some cases. That's when they get what they call sarcopenic obesity, yep. which is where you've got uh, inadequate muscle mass, regardless whether you've got too much fat or not. You could have normal fat mass, but yep. not enough muscle. You're still obese. Tearing of the flesh, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Sarcasm um, yeah, yeah, means yeah. to tear flesh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's, yeah, stripping off flesh through sarco <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah. Um, so basically um, insulin resistance in those sort of people. So if you're a sort of person that struggles to build muscle and yep. you're constantly holding fat and you, yep. no matter how hard you train, consuming something that triggers an insulin release before training will not stimulate muscle growth like it will in a fit, healthy person, yep. but will preserve fat. Wow. But someone that's lean and shredded and fit and trained and is consistently trained where they've actually had the mitochondrial changes that yeah, come with fitness, density, yeah, yeah they, they don't have these same results as someone with a slower metabolism, a different body composition. So that's why there's a lot of trainers out there or a lot of people out there saying this is what works for me you should do it it'll work for you too if you just have willpower yeah right it's not always the case yeah right so so i think there'd be a lot of people happy to hear that there's probably a lot of trainers that listen to this as well too that might be picking up some tips on how to modify you know for for obviously to go shake it up yeah you know it's all about changing these things so what we've said so far is fasted cardio burns more fat right because you're in a glycogen depleted state Mm -hmm. You've got um, no less insulin mm-hmm. floating around, switching off fat burning temporarily. Yeah, which means during your, you know, uh, fasted cardio, yeah, you're actually burning a lot more fat if you haven't eaten before. Otherwise, I don't want a fasted cardio. Otherwise, would we? No, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah so, and, and we spoke a little bit about that in the hep- hepatothermic yeah. episode last week yep. as well, too. I'll tell you something else that's interesting before I forget. What's that? The research also shows that. Um, you don't have to be fully glycogen depleted to burn good amounts of fat during fasted cardio. Right. Because basically they've had studies where they show full glycogen depletion, even up to fully glycogen loaded, and you get pretty similar amounts of fatty acid oxidation during exercise as long as you haven't eaten directly before that meal. Because a lot of guys that well, have got a little... So you can eat at night. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. You can yeah. you can replenish your glycogen at night, Yes. have the glycogen reserves in the morning, yeah. and as long as you don't have that insulin spike before training, you're still capable of burning the same amount of fat as if you're fully glycogen depleted. And that comes back to also preferentially choosing low GI carbohydrates and trickling them in. Chris mm. Thomas, I know, is a huge fan of actually having carbohydrates later in the day yeah. than what he would earlier in the morning. I yeah. hope you don't mind me saying that, Chris. And he's got still lots mix of it up, you know? chips and tricks in terms of the ways that he will consume food. Yeah, you know? yeah. And then what the key so what we've said so far is you don't necessarily even need carbs immediately after that training for protein synthesis. Well, so imagine yeah. this. You've, you've, you've eaten your carbohydrate yep. at night, like a nice healthy um, you know, dinner, yep. including low GI complex carbs full of fibre that will get all the way down to the large intestine and fuel your good organisms and bacteria and pearl, stuff. Pill barley. Yeah, all that, sort of, that yeah. sort of stuff. Yeah, I love it. And then, yeah, and then bars, basically yeah. fasted cardio in the morning. Yep. Immediately after that, you don't even need to replenish those carbs and replenish that glycogen straight away to maintain or build muscle, mm. which is great news because that means you can stay – glycogen depleted for a longer period of time, which keeps you faster metabolic rate and improve insulin sensitivity. So basically fasted cardio. Now there's some cool tricks I'm going to show you to do before fasted cardio sooner or later. And I've got two questions I have to ask yeah, you on it. that. Go. A lot of the guys that are training for maximizing muscle and wanting to burn fat. Mm. So this is probably the more higher end guys and girls that are potentially going on stage or just wanting to maximize their results, right? Like mm. in terms of really get fit and really get muscles and lean. Post-workout high GI carbohydrates Mm -hmm. to induce an insulin response, which, as we say, is anabolic because Mm. the theory of thought is this, is taking carbohydrates, especially high GI carbohydrates, post-weight training to induce insulin and to help protect the protein from gluconeogenesis. 
So what I'm saying, Matt, is they will train with weights and they will deliberately use dextrose or other high GI carbohydrates to induce insulin and to replace glycogen. And that way the protein won't be used for energy. If, if, does that make sense? Yeah, no. Uh, and we talk about gluconeogenesis first yeah, as well too. So, yeah. so, so what's happening? Tell yeah, me. Well, basically what's happening in that situation is that, you know, we talk about the glycogen window, which is a period of time where your body's craving carbohydrates to put in to replenish the glycogen. Mm -hmm. And they say, you know, it extends out for that 20 minutes. Yeah. It actually extends out until you've replenished the glycogen. So until you have replenished the glycogen, you remain insulin sensitive. Um, and that because your muscles are craving it. So you don't really need to force it in within that 20 or 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. You know, what about catabolism though? Surely there's a point where the body goes, you know what? Oh yeah. So basically what you're looking at is when you're throwing in the carbohydrates, it's going to go through and replenish the glycogen. Yep. Okay. If you weren't to put the carbohydrates in, you were just to use protein. Mm -hmm. When you find a combination of protein, so if you lose all the essential amino acids with branch chains and that sort of stuff, you'll find each amino acid has a different role. Some go into protein synthesis, others go into glycogen replenishment. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you don't basically eat that protein food and then all of it converts to sugar and then it goes through. Each amino acid does a different role. Like leucine will go straight in for protein synthesis. Yes. Um, and other amino acids will contribute to the conversion to sugars and then storage form of glycogen. Yeah. They all do help the delivery of creatines and that mm -hmm. sort of stuff in. Mm -hmm. So that's a good strategy. And that's the best way to supplement with creatine is post-exercise after you've depleted your ATP. Yes. But this is what you're actually doing. You're actually reloading your muscle cells with glycogen mm -hmm. and ATP. Right. Both. Even if you're just eating protein. No, what I'm saying is when you're combining the when you're having oh, your right. protein, carbs, creatine, yes. what you're actually doing is you're providing some protein for protein synthesis. Mm -hmm. You're providing the rest the carbohydrates and the creatine to replenish glycogen yep. and ATP. Yes. All those things are water soluble inside the muscles. They help to puff it up. They mm -hmm. fill it up. Mm -hmm. Maintains that muscle mass by maintaining muscle volume, maintaining muscle hydration. Yep. And um, again, like you're saying, it stops muscle catabolism in the form of the breakdown of muscle glycogen. You know, so um, it stops you from having to um, um, break down uh, as much glycogen next time you train. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So basically, what you find in that sort of strategy, that's what you're doing. That's fine for muscle growth and probably a good strategy if your priority is to grow. Yes. But if your priority is for fat burning and you want to maintain a fast metabolic rate for the 24 hours after that training, uh -huh. then you can do the same thing without the carbohydrate. Uh -huh. You're going to get equal amounts of protein synthesis. Mm -hmm. Creatine will be absorbed effectively into muscles without carbohydrate if you use a post-workout because it's craving it. Mm. So you got to understand that the creatine is just making ATP. So the depletion of ATP or the depletion of the creatine phosphate reserves that they use to resynthesis, resynthesize ATP, um, when that's low, the creatine is going to be sucked in. Well, it's funny. The bigger I, problem is loading. You know, they, that, a lot of that stuff comes from the loading of creatine. You know, people say, oh, we load, you know, yeah, for like yeah. we, we load up on these big doses of creatine for a period of time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's got to go somewhere, you know. you you got to – the best way to absorb creatine is deplete your creatine stores yep. and then it's craving it and it sucks it straight through. Yeah. So, you know, so just to – while we're talking about creatines and glycogens and that sort of stuff, like, when we're doing our exercise, what we want this creatine, what we want this ATP and glycogen and everything for is, well, what we want creatine for is for the ATP generation. Mm -hmm. That's our first 10 seconds of exercise. Yep. So when we do our initial launch or a little burst of energy that you'll find with high-intensity cardios and all that sort of stuff, yep. so our first 10 seconds is when we're basically using ATP. Mm -hmm. And then what's happening is the reserve creatine phosphate in reserve is used to resynthesize that ATP yep. when we slow down the intensity or when we have a break between bouts. You know, when you're walking back, you're yep. regenerating that ATP, yep. then you sprint, you go again. That's how it's working. As soon as you go past those to like 10 seconds and that sort of stuff, um, then it's when you're going into your aerobic metabolism, when you're starting to burn, burn stored glycogen and then going into fatty acid burning and that sort of stuff as yep. well. So yep. that that's the whole concept is, is, that creatine ATP stuff, it's only for the explosive thing. Mm -hmm. um, but with the um, um, with the basic uh, aerobic metabolism, that's the we want to spend as much time as possible in the aerobic metabolism because that's oxidation. 
So aerobic revol- involves um, oxygen. Yes. And that's fatty acid oxidation is what we're talking about with fat burning. You can't burn anything without oxygen. So mm-hmm. that's the point that we want. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what we've got to um, That's what we've got to get. And, yeah. again, this comes down to steady-state cardio versus high-intensity. So, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of people, I mean, again, you look at a sprinter's physique, for example, yeah. they don't do a heck of a lot of steady-state cardio. They're built for power. Yep. They, they are built for performance, high-intensity, short duration. Mm. You know, they might do, you know, 20, 100-metre sprints, maybe, yeah. I don't know, 10, 200-metre sprints. Sorry, if you're a sprinter, I don't know how you train. But, I mean, this mm. is – I can't see a sprinter going out and running a half marathon. I mean, mm. like, that's going to be counterintuitive to what they're trying to achieve. Yeah. But yet they're lean and ripped. Yep. You look at a long-distance runner, they're not as ripped, and mm. they've got a hell of a lot less muscle mass as well too. So yeah. there is obviously a point where you break the catabolism. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well – when you do the research on – well, so basically let's talk about what how to burn fat during exercise. Yes. Then, and this will link in with this because yeah. once you get those first 10 seconds and that sort of stuff out of the way, we're starting to go into aerobic metabolism. Yep. So, you know, when we're just sitting around, all right, so when we're sitting here doing nothing, uh-huh. our body's constantly releasing fat into our bloodstream. Mm-hmm. We've got enough fat liberated in our bloodstream to fuel our resting metabolic rate, you know. Mm-hmm. When we start exercising, we start burning some of that fat and we start dragging some of that stuff in to compensate our, for our increased energy requirements. Um, what happens is when we get to about, you know, half, half exertion, when we're about 50% up to 65% of our exertion, mm-hmm. we've actually got to the point where we can't, where we've actually taken all of the free fatty acids out of our bloodstream in to burn for fuel. If we go beyond that, we're not burning any more fat. Right. You Which get is to this with that sixty-five percent heart rate. Yeah. Train it that. Yeah. They talk about heart. Yeah. They talk about heart minutes rate, an hour. exertion. Or, yep. Yeah. So basically, that's what they're saying is, if you can get to that point of exertion, mm-hmm. you're going to be, and you maintain that for as long as possible, you're going to be burning fat through that time period because there's only so much fat that's available in your bloodstream that it's capable of sucking in at any one time. Mm. Okay. High intensity cardio, which goes up to that you know eighty five percent you know sort of thing exertion, um, and like short little sprinting things, doesn't burn as much fat during the exercise. But what it does is it causes massive depletions of the glycogen. Yep. It causes a lot of adaptation changes in our mitochondria, mm-hmm. where they actually improve their ability to suck fat through for fuel and that sort of stuff. Right. And they also improve the ability for the afterburn, you know, so you get, you actually deplete everything so much, you trigger all these changes within the mitochondria to spend the rest of the day sucking fat through to replenish everything you've exhausted during your high intensity. Uh So they both work. Yes. Um, What's interesting though, there is a, there are ways, and this is what I'm really excited about because what I've been trying to work on is, there are ways of increasing our fatty acid oxidation right up to about 85% exertion by actually increasing the ability for the body to liberate more free fatty acids. Mm. So what I was saying is we hit a wall with fat burning yep. because we run out of available fat mm-hmm. in the bloodstream. We run out of available oxygen mm-hmm. in the bloodstream. That's when they talk about VO2 max and yep. lactic thresholds and all that sort of stuff. Yep. So we get to a point where we've depleted the fat of our bloodstream. We can't get any more oxygen in, so therefore we can't oxidize that fat for, to make energy. Yeah. If we overcome those hurdles, so if we use lipolytic agents before and during exercise to increase the amount of lipolysis, which is the liberation of stored fat into free fatty acids into the bloodstream. Yes. That's how lipo, you know, they talk about lipolysis. I've heard of lipolysis. Yeah, 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 yeah which is release of fats. That's how your fat burning stimulants and that sort of stuff work. You know, these things that they always talk about increased free fatty acid release and um, mobilise stored fat. That's how things like subcut and that work. Subcut will actually just mobilise stored fat out of um, storage sites into the bloodstream so you're capable of burning it, you know. It doesn't mean that you will though, does it? No, no, no. No, unless you do it this way. You've got to do it as part of diet and exercise. That's right. So basically if we increase the amount of um, fatty acids that are available, and if we hit a switch that increases the amount of oxygen that's delivered into the mitochondria at the same time, mm. then you can your fatty acid oxidation can move from half and two thirds exertion all the way up to three quarters or up to eighty five percent exertion, which mm. means during high intensity cardio, you in a fasted state, you can burn a hell of a lot more fat because the body's pulling for more fat from reserves more yep. quickly. Yes. So yes. then the body can then go, great, there's heaps of fat here, so we can tap into that. So theoretically then it should cause 
less glycogen depletion and also less um, catabolic activity for muscle tissue as well. Is that correct or not? No, opposite. When we burn. No, no, muscle tissue. Yeah, no, we're burning. We burn everything. Right. See, this is the point, man, is um, your muscles are constantly either using ATP yeah. or creating ATP. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So basically what happens is when you switch over to aerobic metabolism, yeah. what we're trying to do is we're trying to, like, for example, if you look at AMP-K, AMP-K mm-hmm. activation, mm-hmm. when you activate this particular messenger, what happens, a cascade of events that basically says to the body, whatever fuel is available, get it and burn it to make ATP. Mm -hmm. So it'll burn muscle glycogen and it'll burn fatty acids at the same rate. Will it burn muscle tissue? Like muscle? No, 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 no. That's what I meant. No, no, sorry. No, no, no. We're not going to... We're not going to liberate protein out of muscle. That's what I mean. Yeah, no, no, sorry. No, we deplete the glycogen. No, that's yep. all catabolism. Fatty yep. acid oxidation is catabolism. Yep. Um, glycogen depletion is catabolism. Yep. But um, no, we shouldn't go into that stage. You know, yep. We've got to maintain. And then the way to compensate for that is maintaining a good amino acid pool through your post-workout supplementation. And this is mm. where, again, man, sorry, I know that you're on a, on a track mm. here. This is mm. where a lot of people go, well, I know. I'll mm. make sure I'm not going to lose muscle tissue, mm. so I'm going to throw in amino acids while yeah. I'm training. Yeah. Problem is, is they can compete with the fat in your body yep. that we're trying to burn. So the body We want the, the glycogen to be depleted yep. because we want to force the body to have to burn fat. Yes. And we want to then tell the body to liberate as much fat as possible. Yeah. So if you look at that AMP-K, you yeah. look at that one switch, like that's the master switch that at that point where your ATP is depleted to a state, yeah, it's AMP-K activation that tells your body you have to switch over to aerobic metabolism, uh-huh. you have to start shuttling all this oxygen through, you have to start sucking all this fat through because there's nothing else available. Mm-hmm. AMP-K activation then even sends a message to the fat cells, liberate as much fat as you can. It sends messages through to the respiratory tract and heart and it makes sure there's adequate oxygen, you know. So basically all these things happen at once with an AMP-K activation. Yeah. So what happens is you burn, you do your 10 seconds of your creatine and ATP. Mm-hmm. The rest of it, we're forcing the body to burn fat through AMP-K activation. Mm. And what it does is it's like it's like the ignition switch, you know. It just it puts the... Um, it's, it makes sure we've got the the flame and the tinder, you know what so I mean? It's like the primer, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So it, it makes sure there's blast that oxygen in at the same time as it blasts the fat in. So it's just it's like blasting fuel into the mitochondria for the purpose of generating ATP to fuel that exercise. Mm. Anything that involves the utilisation of ATP, such as building fat cells or um, eating or um, you know, all that sort of stuff, is all switched off. And basically says, don't anything that's going to waste this ATP, don't do it. We're not going to do anything now but burn, 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 burn. And the cool thing is, is that depletes all of the glycogen, it strips all that fat out, you burn everything, and then it maintains a very fast metabolic rate for the rest of the 24-hour period. That's why the glycogen depletion, the low insulin, the fasted state combined with the MK activation, Mm -hmm just creates a, an environment within your muscle cells for the rest of the day that you're going to be continually trying to suck fat through and burn through and keep that metabolic rate cranking. So, and Matt, we've, we've got the oxygen, O2 and fat burning. And mm-hmm. we've got, last week we did the, um, you know, uh, hepatothermic, you know, yep. fat burning. This is kind of a combination of all these things. We've yeah. spoken about insulin and glucagon and all these sorts of things. Yep. So, again, in summary, mm-hmm. and can you also... Describe when we should potentially look at steady state cardio versus high intensity. And, and again, look, let's mix talk, it up. That's the thing. It's variety. About, They're both talk, right. Uh, that's right. Mm. And it also comes down to you as an individual. Mm. I know that we've mentioned this before. Um, Anne Marie does mm. not like high intensity because it makes her muscles stringy. She's got yep. for a particular look. I mean, mm. she knows her body so well. Yeah. So the high intensity cardio is not going to be high on her list. But mm. for nine out of ten people, for mm. ninety nine out of a hundred people. Mm. They're interested in burning fat, yep. which most people are. Yeah. You know, mixing up high intensity is definitely yep. a tool to use. Yeah. Yep. So, Matt, 24 hour period. Mm-hmm. Someone's there, they're the average person. Yeah. Maybe not at the higher end, like some of these finely tuned athletes that jump on stage. Yeah. But they want to maximize fat burning and minimize muscle tissue loss. Yeah. Give me a rundown. How, how would you, how would you, how do would you approach it? I'd do cardio. Yep. So, I do get up in the morning. Yep. Okay, 
you can butter up with the subcuts or something to liberate those fatty acids. Mm-hmm. It's going to take a good 20-odd minutes sort of thing to liberate the subcutaneous fat into the bloodstream. Yeah. So you can do that before you go. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a couple of other supplements that I might tell you about in a future episode once I'm allowed to that um, we're releasing that you might want to do prior to exercise. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to do a podcast just on how that works and you're going to freak out because mm-hmm. I am still freaking out. This is the product we've just received the patent on, correct? Yeah. 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 We're allowed to talk about it soon. Yeah. Um, so you want to exercise in a glycogen depleted state first thing in the morning, okay? Mm-hmm. Which basically means fasted cardio, and you want to mix it up between um, the the high intensity and then that slow and steady. Yeah. Um, so ch- chop and change. Chop and change. Yeah, and you could even do what I do. You know, you predominantly do slow and steady, except for that one dog that comes out, and I do a quick little bit of high <laughs> intensity <laughs> just to get down the road a bit, and then um, back to steady. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so that's what you want to do. You want to exercise first thing in the morning. Immediately after that, you can consume some protein, yeah. okay? Now, make sure the protein contains all the essential amino acids and a measurable dose of branch-chain amino acids, in yep. particular good leucine. doses of leucine. Mm-hmm. Um, and really, um, you only really need, um, what is it, for a 40-kilo body weight, I don't know how many 40 kilo, but that works out to be about 10 grams. So you only really need about 20 grams of essential amino acids and branch chain combination in a hydrolyzed whey base or something, you know, like that, a hydrolyzed protein base. You need about 20 grams of that if you're 80 kilos. That contributes to protein synthesis. The rest really? thing can contribute through to glycogen conversion to sugars and replenishing glycogen. Man, that is going to be really hard, especially mm. for the guys who have actually and girls mm. that have got, got a little bit of physique because yeah. they're always told, you know, yeah. two grams of protein per kilo body weight and mm. I now consider that not enough and they'll go to three kilos yeah. th- three and grams that's fine I mean if you have too much then what happens is a certain amount of it will contribute to glycogen replenishment mm-hmm. the rest of it will contribute to the amino acid pools that you use for liver detoxification brain it's not that big a deal man you know I'm just telling you when they've done the studies post training this is how much of those amino acids actually get incorporated into muscle tissue for the purpose of protein synthesis. Mm-hmm. The others go other places and do other jobs. Yep. So it's not that bad, you know. And we know, yeah. obviously, lipotropic amino acids to help with, you know, the liver as well too. Yeah, that's right. Pat- pat- patathermic, and we're yep. also making sure oxygen, Matt. I mean, you know, combs on Q10, we spoke about mm. that. We've spoken about the shilajit. Yeah, well, they're all things them. you can load up on, yep. you know. And they're not – what about timing of nutrients? Well, hang on. Then? Let me finish this oh, sorry. first question you just asked me. <laughs> I get excited. So basically, yeah, so fasted cardio, yep. um, deplete that glycogen, load up on some amino acids to support protein synthesis, then you don't have to rush in and have that next meal. So you can then That's basically... That's post-training, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So post-training. Then basically have your post-training meal, give it half an hour or so for those amino acids to go in and work and be absorbed. Maybe have your post-training meal an hour later. Mm-hmm. But what, what you want that post-training meal to be is low GI, okay? So whatever carbohydrates you put in, you want high fiber, you want a high protein meal, you want good fats, and you want your carbohydrates in there to be low GI because we don't really want to rush that glycogen replenishment back in. We want to kind of trickle the carbohydrates in throughout the day not and not necessarily go through and, yeah, we don't want to switch off the fat burning. We want to kind of stay glycogen depleted as much as possible throughout the day. Mm. So you want to keep those carbs low and slow mm-hmm. all day and then make sure that um, you can actually replenish those carbs at night yeah. to actually rebuild that glycogen level so they're available for your next morning's training. Yeah, you can still do resistance exercise as well, by the way. So you can choose to do that immediately after your fasted cardio or you could do that another time of the day. What about doing yeah. weights first when you're up and you're fresh which is obviously depleting and I mean, yeah, some, depending just on the depleting weight you're glycogen, then. Yeah. yeah and then and then maybe throwing a bit of uh, high either intensity and, high intensity yeah. either directly after yep. your weight training or in between sets which yeah. you know yeah could, so could it doesn't work. really matter you mean that's the thing that that's why I love people working with coaches because that's the stuff people chop and change. Yeah, it was Sam Heron said to me one day too, and I said, "Which which do you reckon's better? Steady state, cardio yeah, steady, high yeah." And she said, "Whichever, which the one that you do." Yeah, <laughs> you know. And I even right asked answer. the same question as I said, "Morning or afternoon?" And she says, "The one that you do." Yeah, you know, because the stuff you do typically works better than the stuff you don't. Well, you know? we're really just talking about finding those little tips mm. and tricks that can mm. add up to ten percent here, five percent here you know, 15% there and yep. all of a sudden you're burning, you know, twice as mm. much fat, you know, by making some changes to your, um, you know, the way that you work out and the way that you eat. Yeah, the other, the other thing that I want to so after we've done that glycogen depletion through that fasted cardio, we've activated that AMPK, that stimulated our metabolic rate and everything, we want to keep stoking that metabolic fire. So that's where we use things like the T432+, which is just a 
uh, product that works via the basal metabolic rate, you know, via the thyroids and mm-hmm. e- insulins and estrogens and everything to keep a fast metabolic rate going. Mm-hmm. That's the sort of thing you want to be doing for the twenty four, the other twenty three hours a day yeah. that you're not exercising, because like I said previously, typically we have enough free fatty acids liberated into our bloodstream throughout the day um, to actually supply our resting metabolic rate. So if we have a faster mes- uh, metabolic rate, we're going to be burning through more of those fatty acids throughout the day. Mm-hmm. And in a glycogen depleted state, you're going to be um, doing that. Now, we've exactly. spoken before, Matt, about supplement timing. Now, mm-hmm. I know a lot of people now, the, with the pre-workout becoming extremely popular, there's pre-workout fat burners out there as well too. Yeah. Let's not talk about um, you know artificial sweeteners and potential mm-hmm. insulin releases from those products, but let's look at a free-form amino acids to help with liberating fat, things like inositol-choline. Now, we touched on that with the hepatic thermic mm-hmm. last time. You also talk about L-carnitine as well too, and we've yep. spoken about that before. It does not matter when you take L-carnitine, just so long as it is present yeah. uh, and you've got reserves of that. Yep. What about utilising things like... Um, inositol and choline before training or it doesn't matter that's the same as the l-carnitine so long as you uh, have it yeah it works so yeah yes and no i mean there's some other little tricky things like um uh, like there's some supplementation stuff like biotin high doses of biotin and that that will block the ability for the liver to pump sugar out you know that'll force the body to go into fat to a certain degree mm-hmm. you know acetyl and choline's more as making sure you're not deficient in it so they're capable of working as the hepatothermics but if when you they need that, to could that blunt fat burning i mean would the body oxidize it dep- it's it? more to do with, if you put take those things pre workout it's more yeah. to do with the base that you take them with yeah like if you were to take those particular vitamins and amino acids um you know, in a capsulated form without any sweeteners, sweeteners or other fillers and yep. things like that because it's also a lot of the other fillers, these other little stuff they put in the powders to actually change mouthfeel mm-hmm. and all that sort of stuff that actually screw with our um, our metabolic rate, you know, by changing hormonal secretions and that mm-hmm. sort of stuff. So a lot of the problem with those sort of supplements is just getting them into the spot without creating other effects along the way. Mm. But, yeah, absolutely, inositol-choline, uh, even like acetylcarnitine without the sweeteners and that mm-hmm. sort of stuff is effective, you know, yeah. to actually load up on that extra carnitine because it will, it's supplementing with extra carnitine, even pre-workout, will upregulate carnitine palmitol transferase, mm-hmm. which is the fat burner, yep. to a certain degree as long as we don't have the insulin blunting it. Yes. Yeah. So, so no sweet. If you're going to do that, that free form amino acid, make sure there's not something hidden in the base. Yeah. And also told choline, yeah. acetyl L carnitine. We just take them pure. Yeah. Which is re- that's hard pretty hard. because it, Well, it's not only hard to find, it's hard to measure. Yeah. Uh, they, they, they often add, like, for example, these things are like you know, one fifteenth of a teaspoon or something stupid. So they measure it out. They, they thin it out with something so you can actually measure it in teaspoon sizes so you're not killing yourself and stuff, you know. Yeah, and they don't always um, have that on the label either. I no. Mean, these are the things that we're finding out, obviously, with oh, you know, a lot of the amino acids. Yeah, so well, like, it says 100% pure, but it's actually not. Yeah, well, there is a percentage of it is that. Is 100% pure. Yeah. <laughs> like, so 80% of the time I'm right every time, you know. Yeah, it's yeah. like, yeah, so they'll say it's 100% pure, but it's only 80% of the blend. Yeah. You know, so and the rest of it is, it is a drying agent like a sugar or yep. a maltodextrin or a starch. Yeah. So all those sort of things have to be taken into consideration. Um, a lot of the other things that we see in pre, pre-workout nutrition are better post anyway. It's just that marketing-wise there was no like target demographic for post-workout for a period of time. Everyone wanted pre-workout. So all the companies that were trying to make post-workouts just put them in pre-workout formulas so people would buy them. Yep. But all the research for creatine, glutamine, and all that sort of stuff should be post-workout. Right. You're better off replenishing them once depleted than trying to load up something that's full. Mm. Yeah, so, um, yeah, that, that's the main thing there with that supplementation. The weird one is the, um, the pre-workout stuff. It takes a real strategy to get a proper pre-workout fat burner. That's why we've been working on this for so long because it's not just looking at the um, pharmacology, you know, and that sort of stuff. Yep. It's actually looking at the base, the mouth feel, the brain. Uh, so much of all this sort of stuff, our brain is just so smart. We've got these systems in our body that work instantly. You know, yeah. like, you know, we turn, with that, we're talking about Ken Way the other way, yeah. you know, with that neurophysics stuff. Yeah. And, like, one of the things that he mentioned, it sticks out, you know, that the brain... Um, has reflexes of 0.6 of a second where our body has a 0.1 second reflex, you know. Um, So basically what happens is 
we do all this thinking in our brain, but mm. I mean, our body's already made the changes. Mm. So when you put something into your mouth that the, the body assumes is going to be providing carbohydrates and that sort of stuff, changes within our body have occurred, you know, instantly. Um, they can easily be turned back, but there's a handbrake that's been pulled on just before you start, you know. And this is where Matt, we can use that to our advantage. I know I've, um, we've spoken yeah. about it before. When you wake up or after a period of fast, the mm. first thing that you put into your mouth mm. can also enhance or put a handbrake on how you're going to burn fat. Yeah, exactly. So choose to put things in that are going to help to enhance fat burning. Yeah, so like, yeah, you know, that's fats right. Fats and, and essential oils and things like that are going yep, to be more yep. beneficial. I know a lot of people use MCT. Yeah, exactly. When they get up just to prime the pump, which yeah. is not a bad idea. No, MCT is a, a beautiful fuel to go straight in for ketogenic stuff. You yeah, know? cracker. Mm. Matt, um, Anything else you want to say on that? We covered enough? No, I'm bored with that. We'll right. get, what we'll do is we'll do another really cool one when I get allowed to talk about the really cool stuff too. Okay. That makes sense? Yeah, absolutely it does. Thanks. <laughs> uh, thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll be back next week. All right. Thanks for listening. And remember, question everything. Well, except what we say. You never close your eyes. Anymore when I kiss your lips, man. That's disgusting. <laughs> I know, so close them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. <They're> close. Uh, <laughs> I noticed. That was actually uh, clever. Uh, uh, this uh, is going to be an interesting podcast. All right, Ch- sound, sound check. check. Check it. Check, check it. Sound. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it'll be fine. All right, anyway. All right, ready?